So we're looking at Matthew chapter 13. We want to begin reading at verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given to you to, uh, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And whoever has to him, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I say to you, uh, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Uh, Jesus, are you talking about us? And you're not mad at me. You're not trying to uh, keep stuff from me. You want me to know, don't you? You're trying to communicate to me. You're desperate that I would know the truth. You really want me to get in on all of this. You want me to know your heart. You want me to embrace you. What keeps me from it? Would you let every obstacle between you and me just be melted away tonight? Would you let your truth do to me what it needs to do? I'm open. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I thought really that we would just kind of move away from chapter 12 and just move into chapter 13, and I'd never have to mention chapter 12 again. But uh, that just isn't happening at all. I've become more convinced, and of course this is all coming out of saturation, the saturation idea, and I've become more convinced that uh, the uh, material, the context of the whole material becomes really really significant and especially the way he's writing he is he is going someplace with all of this and you don't want to miss it now when you go back to chapter 12 all of chapter 12 and chapter 13 now that we're dealing with are all found in on the same day so all the events that are taking place are all taking place on this sabbath day and that's what they're dealing with and the first event that took place on the sabbath day in chapter 12 verse 1 through 9 8 1 through 8, is the grain field scene where the disciples, of course, are picking grain and the uh, Pharisees, in verse 2, are re really strongly after them, saying, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. And Jesus gives them great truth. Then you move to chapter 12, verse 9, and they, of course, are in the synagogue. And again, Jesus does a phenomenal thing, and they knew he would. They set him up for it, a man with a withered hand, and he heals on the Sabbath day. And then Jesus, in verse 14 through 12, in response to that, gives them a phenomenal truth again and, and, and encourages them to understand it. And then you come to verse 14 down through verse 21, which is the conference scene. The, dis, the Pharisees have all gone into the conference room and plotted murder while Jesus has gone with the multitude and is doing all this healing. So all these miracles are taking place. They come out of the conference room, come into this miracle scene, where Jesus is just healing all the multitudes, all on the Sabbath day, understand. And as Jesus is doing all of this healing, they break in, the Pharisees break into this accusation of accusing him of doing this all through the power of the devil, Beelzebub, the ruler of the devil, in verse 24. The rulers of the demons in verse 24. Jesus, again, from verse 25 down through verse 37, just gives them overwhelming truth. Finally, in desperation, a group of them come to Jesus and say, listen, let's settle this whole issue. Just come and give us a sign. And Jesus says, I'm not against signs. I will give you a sign, but you won't like it because we're not on the same page. You're not thinking like I think. In fact, hey, you're, you're not even in the same. I don't think you're in the same world I'm in. And he gives them the sign of the cross. But they didn't get it because it wasn't the kind of sign they wanted or could understand. And he gives them this phenomenal truth 
revolving around that sign from verse 20, 39 down through verse 30, 45. Then Jesus goes into a house. His mother and half-brothers come, of course, and say, hey, send him out here. We want to talk to him. And Jesus does this thing like, who, are, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he goes through this, this illustration of saying, listen, this is about the overwhelming issue of being birthed. That's what this is about. And you Pharisees see he's using this whole scene to teach the Pharisees that he's been trying to teach all this time. And he gives them this tremendous truth that the connection is all in the birthing from above. In other words, it's all about nature. It's all about the DNA. It's all about whether you have the DNA of the father or whether you don't. That's the whole key. See, it isn't about your rules and it isn't about, oh, I am religious. It isn't about crossing yourself, counting bead stuff. What it's all about is it's about a birthing from within, which is the very nature and life of God that permeates the depth of your life. And boys, you don't have that. And these guys do. That's why you don't get the signs. That's why you accuse me of operating out of the devil when revival is taking place in Israel. That's why I talked to you about the grain field thing and you didn't understand. That's why I discussed with you the withered hand deal and gave you an illustration about it and, and you didn't even, whoa, it went. Pfft. And that's why after all the truth I've given you, you're still plotting murder in the conference room. That's why, because we, haven't, we, we aren't birthed by the same father. My father is the heavenly father. Your father's the devil. So we don't think alike. Now you'd think Jesus would wipe his hands and say, on that, that's done. I'm out of here. He did slip out the back door and he did go down by the sea. And according to verse 1, when he went down by the sea, he sat by the sea and it wasn't long until the multitudes found out where he was. Same day, same multitude, same group. And they began to surround him. And he began to tell these parables. Now, we start out with one parable. It's chapter 13, verse 3. It's the parable of the sower. You know it, so I'm not even going to go through it at this point. But he gives uh, nine verses of that parable. He ends up in verse 9, and here's what he, he, he ends the parable by saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, the disciples are so, so struck with this whole thing. And probably it was more than this parable. See, we don't know how many parables Jesus told. We only have this one given right here. There will be seven altogether in this chapter, but he only gives, uh, Matthew only gives one right here. May have been Jesus had told uh, lots of parables uh, along with them. But anyway, the disciples are so struck with the fact that Jesus has changed his whole method, method of preaching. They are so struck with this that they come to him privately. Now, we don't know how that was done. The, the, uh, the multitude is on the shore. They got so close in pressing Jesus that he got into a boat and went offshore and was teaching them from the boat. So maybe in the middle of this whole discourse, the disciples are literally waded into the water, come out to the boat and said, listen, Jesus, what is going on with you? You on pills? What happened to you? You've changed your whole method of preaching. You're not doing anything like you did. Something... Somebody flipped the switch on you. Somebody did something. What, what, what's the deal? Why? And they asked this question in verse 10. Why do you speak to them in parables? Now, Jesus is going to give an answer. And, of course, we read the answer. A whole new style. And we want to know why. I'd like to know why. It's interesting that the style of parable of preaching parables is a simple style. It's really simple. You couldn't go to anybody in that crowd after the parable of the sower and say, hey, is there anything about it you didn't understand? They'd have to say, well, no. Here's this guy with a bag of seed. They'd seen that a thousand times. Go into their culture. See, their culture was an agricultural culture as well as a shepherding culture. In fact, they tell us at that time that the ground of Galilee was so fertile that they, everywhere you went, I mean around the houses, every little plot, every little corner, every, everywhere you went, people were growing things. There were gardens and corn and whatever was growing because it was so fertile. So everybody knew about seeds. Everybody knew about plants. 
Jesus was talking their language. So here's, think of the simplicity of this story. Here's a guy, bag of seed, goes out, throws the seed out. Four kinds of soil. We know these soils. There's the pathway. We got it. Hey, seed doesn't do anything on a pathway. Hard. We know that. Hey, there's this rocky soil. We got that. Hey, the, the rocks just, it doesn't go very deep. It's just, and in Tennessee, we certainly know about that. I mean, whoa. It just, it just doesn't go deep enough because you got a rock right underneath, the, right underneath the grass, and nothing could go deep, and the sun comes out with it. There's the soil with the thistles, and it just grows up, and, and, and then there's the good soil. What's the story? What didn't you understand? Well, I understood all that. Is there anything about the sower you don't? No, I get the sower deal. Bag of seed? You've seen that? Yeah, I've seen that. See, the story is so simple that there isn't anybody that couldn't understand the story. But it isn't about the story, is it? I mean, the whole thing is so simple. And in the middle of all of this, I want, I want you to be sure and get this, that Jesus is very, very, not only telling simple stories, but very sensitive. See, it isn't that he doesn't want them to know. It isn't that, well, from now on, I'm going to hide stuff from you. It isn't that. See, it isn't that Jesus is mad, I would think. If I'd have been there, I'd have been mad. All of chapter 12. All the rejection of truth. Every time that he tried to talk to them and, he, and they didn't, whoa, I would have nailed, I would have walked away. I said, I'm never talking to you again. I'm not preaching at this church anymore. Hey, I'm drawing a line. This is it. You don't listen, I'm not, I'm gone. That's what I would have done. So it isn't Jesus is mad. He's not out to get revenge. He's not out trying to, trying to keep the truth from them. He de- you get that from verse 9. He who has ears to hear, oh, please hear. I am trying to tell you something. I really want you to get this. That's the impact of verse 9. So it isn't that Jesus is mad. He sincerely wants them to understand and grasp the truth. Well, why has he shifted? Why has he changed? And you do realize there is a change. I mean, you see it, don't you? See, in chapter 12, he just tells them truth it's direct truth so why has he changed in this telling stories now there's three parts to this concept we'll only do one truth is dangerous the danger of truth this got so heavy on me this week if I'd had time I would have made a skull and crossbones and put it out in front of the church don't come in Dangerous to come in. If we're telling the truth, it's really dangerous. You might want to think it through. You might not want to show up. Why? Because truth will, it's dangerous. Truth is dangerous. Because truth is so powerful that it needs a warning sign Surrounding it because it is absolutely disastrous to hear truth and not embrace it. Oh, it's awful, folks. It's absolutely awful. In fact, I just began to think about verses that give us this kind of impact. And don't want you to look these up. Just listen to them. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow, and as the discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. The word of God, truth, did you get it? The word of God, truth itself is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's not a two-edged sword. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It'll cut you to the bone, brother. In fact, it'll divide your life right down the middle. In fact, it'll bring division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. It is a discerner of every thought 
and intent of the heart and it'll slice you right down the middle and reveal you to the core and everything you've been trying to hide and keep a secret even from yourself is suddenly exposed why truth is coming who wants that see truth is dangerous I mean, if that's, if that's really the truth, I don't even want to know that. I mean, stay away from truth. Why? Because it'll, it'll cut you wide open. It'll embarrass you. It'll reveal you. It'll, it'll show you every little place you're off. And why can't you just be encouraging? See, why couldn't truth just encourage me, pat me on the back? You're doing a good job. Why? Slice. Cut. Truth is dangerous, he said. By the way, that was Hebrews 4.12. Let me give you another one. In him, think about this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John 1, 4 and 5. In him, that's Jesus, was light. Light is parallel all through the scriptures with truth. So Jesus, in him is truth. He is the truth. And when the darkness, which is non-truth, attempts to comprehend, to overwrite, it cannot Darkness cannot stand. There is no resistance. There is no ability. There is no chance. The darkness will overcome light. Light just simply. So if you don't want to be exposed, if you don't want to see things the way they are, if you don't want to see the wart on the end of your nose, if you want to touch the photo, if you just like to imagine, if you want to blame everybody else, if it's never your fault, but it's always someone else's, if you want to live in that world, you don't want truth. Because truth will... You see everything. Could you dim the lights, please? Truth. It's dangerous. Oh, let me give you another one, since you're responding so well. <laughs> Romans 1, 19. Listen to this. For the wrath of God. Ooh. That's really serious. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, that's an interesting subject. Ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What would be the list of sins that that is included in that? Are we going to talk about adultery? Are we going to talk about homosexuality? Are we going to talk about, are we going to talk about, oh, lying, cheating, murdering, stealing? Oh, what? Is this the ungodliness? Listen to the verse. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. See, it's the suppression of the truth. That's where the wrath of God comes. You suppress the truth. In other words, God can tolerate about anything but the suppression of truth. And if you want to live in a world that suppresses truth, that turns the lights down, dims the lights, that, that covers, that lives in deception, and this is not for you. Skull, cross. 
crossbows. Dangerous. Better not listen. Put cotton in your ear. In fact, don't come. Because truth is really, really dangerous. Now, in the context of our passage, that's what's happening. Let's back up. Let's go to chapter 12 again. Here's the grain field scene. Let's just see this in, the, in its context of what he's doing. Chapter 12, verse 1. Disciples were hungry, began to pluck in heads of grain, and began to eat. Verse 2, chapter 12. Pharisees saw it. They said, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. He said to them, and he's going to give them truth. Truth. Not parables. Not stories. Truth. I mean, direct. Look me in the eye. Tell you straight on. Truth. And he does it in three ways first of all he quotes right out of their old testament and talks to them about david a story that they knew well and how david and his boys ate the show bread that was only for the priest and god didn't even give a rip i mean direct truth right out of their scriptures and then he gave the illustration of the priest how God allowed the priest to work like a dog on the Sabbath day and do all this stuff that they said was wrong to do, and he didn't care, and gave them direct truth because people and worship were more important than keeping their law. Truth. And then he quotes the scripture right out of Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, that they would have understood and no one could have quoted themselves, and he didn't camouflage it, didn't cover it, just psh, truth, man, right straight they ignored it see you can't say they didn't get it you can't say it didn't penetrate their lives you can't say it wasn't sharper as sharp as a two-edged sword that cut them to the bone that they just suppressed camouflaged pushed away didn't deal with ran off to the synagogue got a guy with their hand trapped Jesus and then Jesus came again with truth. Oh. Only it wasn't truth out of the scriptures. It was truth in an illustration. Truth that was so plain. I mean, it wasn't, there was no way they could not understand it. It was truth like, hey, sheep falls into the pit, you get him out. Why? He's valuable to you. Man falls into the pit, what do you do? Leave him there. Why? He has no value. Is a sheep more important to you than a man? Oh, yeah. Truth. Whoa. My value system is all messed up. Because my laws revolve around what matters to me. And I'm all messed up. And wouldn't you think you'd fall on your face and say, whoa. No, they went to the conference room and plotted murder to get rid of truth. Now, in that context, do you see what's happening? You march into this after a whole day of that kind of stuff. You come into this setting, and Jesus starts telling stories. Why? Because truth is dangerous. And do you realize what happens to you? Get this. Do you realize what happens to you when you suppress truth? Oh, he gives it to you in verse 12. Whoever has, to him more will be given. Oh, here I am. I'm in a situation where God is giving me truth. I have truth. Guess what? When I respond to that truth, guess what? I get more truth. And when I respond to that truth, I get more truth. And when I respond to that truth, I get more truth. And I am becoming so truthful. 
because what I have to him is given more. Now, what's the opposite of that? Well, he gives it to you in verse 12. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, oh, I have truth. No, I don't. Why? I'm suppressing it. I'm rejecting it. I'm not, I'm not embracing truth in my life. Therefore, I do not have it. And it does not have me. And what happens that, in that situation? Even what he has, even what little bit of truth I had will be taken from me. So I leave the service having rejected truth, and I'm worse off than when I came in the first place. Did you get that? So every time I hear truth and I don't embrace it, I end up with less truth. Worse condition than I was before I heard the truth. So truth always does something to you. If you embrace truth, it expands in your life. If you reject truth, it diminishes. And you're worse. You'd be better off never to hear another word of truth in your life than to hear truth and suppress it. Truth is dangerous. There's only one way to go, folks. Let truth do its thing. Come on, light. Come on, truth. Come on. Reveal. Transform. Strip down. Whatever you need to do in my life. Whatever you say. I'm in. Truth is dangerous. Jesus, what will we do with truth? We only got two possibilities, don't we? We either suppress or we embrace. We either allow or we reject. Truth, Jesus, the truth. You want us to know, don't you? You're desperate for us to know, aren't you? Have we gotten to the point you have to start telling us stories? Because we're rejecting truth? And therefore, we're worse off when you tell us direct truth than when you hide it in a story. Are you taking truth, putting a shell around it so that all we get is the story? And if we don't want to go deeper, we never get to the truth? Because you're afraid for us. Because we don't respond to truth. Would you do something tonight in our hearts and our lives? Would you absolutely bring us to the place where whatever is the truth, we're in. And whatever that does to us, we embrace it. And whatever you, the truth, however you want to shape us, we're available. And whatever you want to take the sharper than a two-edged sword and cut off from us, cut it off. And whatever you want to graft into us, graft it in. Could you tonight, in the name of Jesus, could you tonight give us a hunger for truth that would override our fears and our pride 
and our shame. So we'd never hide again. Only live in the light of truth. Heads are bowed. Are you embracing truth? Would you tremble with me tonight over the fact that we've had truth after truth after truth? Truth has affected us. But wouldn't it be awful if we had less than what we started with. And our lives have diminished. Would you turn him loose in your life tonight? Without hesitation and without resistance, would you turn him loose in your life tonight? Would you let him change anything in you he wants to change? Would you let him correct anything he wants to correct? Would you embrace the truth? Alders open. Be obedient.